Would you all help me give a warm welcome to Elder Robert E. Wells. Brothers and sisters, uh, students, lovers of the Book of Mormon, it's great to be here with you. Uh, this is an interesting experience. Uh, I haven't quite done this before, and so uh, it's, uh, it's been very motivational to me. And I pray that you and I might be united by the Spirit, and that we might understand and that you might forgive my unusual approach to the Book of Mormon. I'm not a PhD in anything. I'm not a great student of anything. I just love the Book of Mormon. And I had an experience a few years ago. Uh, I had an allegorical dream. Now, I'm a banker. I'm an accountant, an economist, as you heard. I, uh, I'm not prone to this kind of thing. I've never had anything like it before nor since. It's a one-time experience. I woke up and told my wife what I had seen, and she wrote it down. And so uh, that's why I know it was a dream. I could see myself at the edge of a large lagoon. I'd say 20 miles long, 10 miles wide. The water was peculiar in that it was buoyant, like, like the Great Salt Lake or the Dead Sea. People didn't have to swim to stay afloat. They were just floating. But to turn, they would paddle. To move, they would paddle. And the people were, there were masses of people floating in this lagoon. Then off at one end of the lagoon, it started to glow. And there was a beautiful hue, a multicolored pastel kind of, of color, uh, an arco iris, uh, uh, northern lights kind of thing. And it was beautiful. And I thought everybody would turn to look at it. Some did. Most did and then turned away. They weren't fascinated with it. But those that were fascinated by the light fixed on it, and as they looked, they were drawn towards the light. And the more they, they looked at the light, the faster they were drawn. They weren't swimming. They were just drawn by this force through the water. And I said, what in the world's going on? What is this? What's happening? And a voice behind me said, this is Christ, and what you're seeing is the light of Christ. And what is drawing people to Christ depends upon their individual faith, diligence, and heed. And I woke up. I knew exactly where that came from. And you know where that comes from. That's the description of how the Liahona worked. And it comes straight from the Book of Mormon. So my subject today, this afternoon, is the peculiar language of the Liahona, which is symbolic of the language of the Book of Mormon. Now, I'm going to go through a series of scriptures I don't think you need to open your scriptures. It'll take you too long, and I'm not going to slow down for you. I have mine marked, and I'll try to tell you where I am, or at least chapter, but not necessarily verse, nor page, nor anything else. But just go, go with me. I'm in 1 Nephi, and the first mention of the Book of Mormon. It came to pass that as my father arose in the morning, you remember, he found this, this to his astonishment a round ball, curious workmanship of brass, and so on. And then it says in verse 16, 1 Nephi chapter 16, we did follow the directions of the ball, which led us in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. In other words, where it had to be where there was water, where there were plants, where there was an oasis or something. Then it goes on, verse 28 says, and the pointers worked according to the faith, diligence, and heed which we did give unto them. And it says, and also there was written upon them a new writing which was changed from time to time. Now, skip down 500 years to Alma, and we're in chapter 37, and it says, verse 43, Now, my son, I would that ye should understand that these things are not without a shadow, a model, a pattern to follow. For as our fathers were slothful to give heed to this compass, 
Now these things were temporal. They did not prosper. Even so it is with things that are spiritual. For behold, it is as easy to give heed to the word of Christ, which will point to you a straight course to eternal bliss, as it was for our fathers to give heed to this compass. Now, I've gone into a little bit of effort to see if there's anything else written about the Liahona. Uh, one thing President Kimball said uh, to a group of young men, he said, wouldn't you like to have a compass, a personal compass like the Liahona to guide you? And then he went on, this is an article that was, a talk that was published in the Improvement Era back in 1961. He said, you do have a compass. It's your conscience. Now, President Monson spoke of the Liahona, and he said, the same Lord who provided the Liahona provides today a rare and valuable gift to us. The gift is called your patriarchal blessing. So we've got a couple of modern applications of the value of the Liahona principle. Obviously, your conscience and your, your the, the uh, patriarchal blessing will guide you according to your faith, diligence, and heed. Now, is there any more modern uh, interpretation of the ancient Liahona? Uh, Hugh Nibley published an article also in the Liahona called the, or in the Improvement Era called the Liahona's Cousins. And he says that in ancient times, some civilizations had arrows that they would throw into the air and the way they fell would determine their future. They would read the future, a type of divination. Sometimes they used darts, sometimes they used rods. And uh, he, Hugh Nibley says, even the Zuni Indians have their arrows of destiny. Now, in Mexico City, in the famous uh, Museum of Anthropology, when we were living there, we found this. We, as you go in the main entrance, you face that huge column with a large platform from which rain is falling. It's, it's symbolic of a rainforest. The building on the left, there are buildings all the way around the perimeter. You go in the entrance to the left and turn left again, and on this wall, like, like that would be the wall, there is a tapestry that is called the Tapestry of Huku Takato. Now, it's eight feet wide, six feet tall. There are 36 frames in it, like a comic strip, but it starts at the top right, comes across, down, goes over and winds around and fills the whole square. I don't know how old the tapestry is, but it's, it's probably about 1000 AD. It's, it's not from Book of Mormon time, but it's, uh, it's not from modern time either. The first of the first 12 frames, 11 of them, the leader of the group, and it's, ob it's a small group, you see figures of people, there's a leader, and they start out and then they cross little, little dippy uh, symbol, which obviously means great waters, or at least we're interpreting it as, as being great waters. The leader is leading his people on a migration from one continent to another across a great ocean, and in 11 of those 12 frames, the leader holds something in his hand suspended by three lines, and it's a round ball. And it could be. Some say it's obviously the Liahona. Others say, oh, it's a Catholic incense burner. Uh, who knows? Right above the hand of the leader is a dove. Now, meaning to me and to most of our students of the Book of Mormon, that, it's a, that it has a spiritual influence or it, is, it works according to the spirit. Now, in Guatemala, the Cachiquel and the Quiche Indians have legends of their forefathers coming across the ocean, being led, and in some cases they talk of a ball, and in some cases they talk of a bundle, which could be a sacred instrument inside a leather pouch. Nobody really knows what this sacred ball or this sacred bundle really is. But there is, or there are remnants of a legend of a Liahona 
among many of the people of Latin America, according to different people that I've, that I've talked to. Now, in spite of what I've just mentioned, the main principle of the book of the Liahona are the triad three categories of faith, diligence, and heed. Now, musicians are accustomed to think of a triad as being a bass note, which is the melody, and then one third above is the second note, and one fifth above is the third note. That forms a tonal chord, which is the basis for all tonal music that we're accustomed to in our culture. I pretend that faith, diligence, and heed, if you give that kind of attention to the Book of Mormon, creates a celestial, spiritual music that you vibrate to, that impresses you, and that uh, causes the messages of the Book of Mormon to jump out at those who are interested in them, or those who look to follow Christ, and are serious students of Christ, uh, you can just chart your course by the Leahona according to your individual faith, diligence, and heed. So now, let me go through some of my favorite scriptures having to do with faith, diligence, and heed in the Book of Mormon. And I'll try to do it as fast as possible. First uh, Nephi, chapter 2, verse 19. We're talking about faith. Blessed art thou, Nephi, because of thy faith. Uh, also says, for thou hast sought me diligently. I've tried to find patterns in the Book of Mormon where faith is significant. And later I'll go through diligence and heed. Faith, of course, can be trust. Diligence can be hard work. Uh, heed is hear, hearken, obey, listen to, etc. So, Nephi. Uh, another example of Nephi's faith, I will go and do the things which the Lord has commanded. First Nephi uh, chapter 3. First Nephi chapter 4. Uh, this is where the Lord has commanded the three brothers to go get, the, uh, get their genealogy, to return to the city of Jerusalem. They fail twice. The third time, Nephi has the, the courage and the determination to serve the Lord, to do what he was told to do, the faith that he will be guided because he knows that anything the Lord commands, he will open the way. And so he goes, finds Laban in the streets. You're all familiar with the story. And, uh, and it's kind of, that, that's worth reading, I think, at this particular point. Behold, the Lord hath delivered him unto, into thy hands. Um, I, he would not hearken unto the commandments of the Lord. He had also taken away our property. Behold, the Lord, slayeth, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. It is better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. Um, just thought I ought to read that. Uh, going on, uh, still with the story of of Nephi. I'm not making a political statement. <laughs> but uh, as, I, as I looked at that this morning, I couldn't help but think of it. Anyway, uh, chapter 17, 1st Nephi chapter 17. This is where Nephi is told to build a ship. His brothers tell him that he's dumb, that he's a fool. A uh, guy from the desert has no business trying to build a ship, etc. And Nephi gives one of those great all-time sermons about the faith of Israel uh, leading them out of Egypt and across the Red Sea and manna from heaven and crossing the Jordan and conquering the people that are occupying the promised land. And, and uh, Nephi gave, makes this class, classic statement in, in uh, chapter 17, verse 50, If God had commanded me to do all things, I could do them. If he should command me that I should say unto this water, Be thou earth, it would be earth. And if I should say it, it would be done. Uh, I, as a young boy, when I read that, I could see the water turning to earth, and I worried about all of the ships of the sea being paralyzed. And, and the sailors, are they going to get off, and is it going to be muddy, and can they can walk to shore, or uh, do they have to stay on the ship? And then I used to worry about the, 
the guys in the submarines when when Nephi says be thou earth and they're really stuck they, there's no way that they can get out of a of a submarine but uh, imagine the the faith of of Nephi I'm going on uh, here's uh, Alma 32 uh, this is classic now as I said con this is Alma chapter 32 verse 21 faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things therefore if ye have faith, ye hope for things that are not seen, which are true. Uh, it's interesting. One of the tests of this life, this mortal probation, is that we demonstrate our faith with a double-blind situation. We can't remember the past, the pre-existence. We can't see the future. We can't even see the spirit world that's, that's close to us. Uh, we have a double-blind test. And so it's a test of our faith how much we want to look at the Book of Mormon, how much we try to, to follow, follow Christ. Uh, oh, there's so many illustrations. You would have your favorite ones. But uh, in Alma 34, there's a very interesting situation that is explained. Uh, because missionaries used to say, President, how much faith does a an investigator have to have to be baptized. And uh, usually we just say, Elder, that's up to you and the district leader that will interview your candidates for baptism to see if they have faith. But every now and then one of them wanted me to give them a measurement. And so this is the scripture that I would use. This is Alma 34, verse 14 is speaking of the atonement. The atonement is a whole meaning of the law. And then it talks about how the atonement works with faith, uh, well, it says with, with mercy overcoming justice. And then verse 15, 16, and 17, it says, this being the intent of this last sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ, to bring about the bowels of mercy, which overpowereth justice, and bringeth about means unto men that they may have faith unto repentance. How much faith do you have to have to be baptized? Not faith to move mountains, not faith to speak in tongues, not faith to heal the sick necessarily, just enough faith to repent. Repentance is the indication as to the faith that a convert needs, and I think it's the indication that the rest of us have to have for the atonement to work to pay for our own individual sin. Because listen, verse 16, we're still talking about faith. How much faith? Thus mercy can satisfy the demands of justice and encircles them in the arms of safety, while he that exerciseth no faith under repentance is exposed to the whole law and the demands of justice. Therefore, only unto him that has faith unto repentance, faith enough to repent, is brought about the great plan of redemption. And a fourth time in three verses, it says, verse 17, I pray that ye may begin to exercise your faith unto repentance. Now, faith enough to repent brings forth some unusual miracles. I was reading this once and meditating on it, and I had one of those flashes of inspiration. What are the best stories about the combination of faith and repentance? And let me share my three favorite ones with you. Faith enough to repent. Enos. Enos wants something desperately. He says, I hungered. My soul hungered. I knelt down. He prayed all day long, and then he prayed all night long, or well into the night. And then the voice came unto him, saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee. Wow! He was repenting. He was feeling sorry for the things he had done. That's why he was praying. And what he was hungering for was forgiveness. And the Lord suddenly forgives him. And in verse 7, my translation, again, Enos says, Wow, Lord, how did you do that? He says, Lord, how is it done? And the Lord said unto me, Because of thy faith in Christ whom thou hast never seen. See the combination of faith in Christ and repentance. And he has one of those unique miracles in the scriptures of his sins being forgiven him. Does it happen again? Yeah. Let's go over to Mosiah chapter 4. King Benjamin has preached a sermon, such a fabulous sermon, 
that the multitude fall to the earth. The fear of the Lord had come upon them. They saw their own sins. They saw their carnal state. They saw that they were less than the dust of the earth. They cried together, Oh, have mercy. Apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins. They are really repenting. They are, they are really suffering because of this. And then it says, um, And it came to pass, after they had spoken these words, they were filled with joy, having received a remission of their sins, having peace of conscience. Why? Because of their exceeding faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, King Benjamin preached the sermon, but they were repenting and they had faith in Christ. Is there any other case? Oh, there are several cases, but let me give you my third favorite one, and then we'll go on. My third one is, uh, is down in Alma, Alma 36. Alma is telling his son Helaman of his own experience. And you remember how, how serious his sins were and he, how tormented he is and the pains of hell and, and he had rebelled against God and so on and so forth. He even wanted to be banished. He wanted to disappear. He wanted mountains to fall on top of him. And it says, as I was thus racked in torment, I remembered the words of my father preaching of one Jesus Christ who should come to atone for the sins of the world. And he says, as my mind caught hold of this thought, Here's another, wow. I cried within my heart, O Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me. Behold, when I thought this, I could remember my, my sins no more. I could remember my pains no more. It went away. It was replaced by joy. He says, so exquisite and sweet was my joy. He says, it even exceeded the exquisiteness of the pain that I was suffering from before. Three examples of faith and repentance. Now, let me go into diligence a little bit. Um, one of my favorite examples of diligence is General Mormon. General Mormon is everybody's favorite personality. Uh, of course, we all have several favorites, but, but what a tremendous, outstanding figure of history. At age, uh, age 10, he received the plates. At age 15, he had a personal vision of the Savior Jesus Christ. At age 16, he was huge of stature, uh, muscular, uh, spiritual, obviously a leader, and they put him in charge of a small army that they had, and he went on to success. A general at age 16, but then he serves as a general for, well, until he's age 40, that's 24 years, and then he takes 10 years, he negotiates a truce, takes 10 years to prepare for another great battle, and then from the time he's 50 to 52, he's a battlefield general again, then he quits disgusted. Maybe he just quits so he has time to prepare the plates to pass on to his son. In any case, he quits, but he's prepared other people to take his place, and so they do, until he's 65 years old, and they plead with him to come back and lead the armies again. He knows it's a lost cause. He knows they're all going to be destroyed because of their wickedness. But again, he leads them. In other words, here is a general that for 45 years, he's been a general of large, large armies. He's been on the battlefield for 33 years. I checked, and even our generals like uh, Patton and Eisenhower and, and MacArthur and so on, even with their military careers, they didn't have that much time as battlefield generals, nor did Wellington, nor did Napoleon, nor did anybody in history have that much time of being a battlefield general. Uh, so when, when Mormon says that he's diligent, we know that he's diligent. Listen to what he says to my son. This is his second epistle to his son Mormon. Now my beloved son, notwithstanding their hardness, let us labor diligently, for if we should cease to labor, we should be brought under condemnation. Doesn't make any difference whether we have success or not. We have a job to do. The Lord has given us a job. That's in Moroni chapter 9, verse, verse 6. Uh, diligence is interesting. Now, let's uh, go to another example of diligence. 
diligence. Uh, now I'm back in, uh, uh, I'm in Alma, uh, Alma 17, and uh, this is about the missionaries, the three sons of Mosiah, Alma. Alma 17, verse 2. We all know this scripture. They had waxed strong in the knowledge of truth. They were men of sound understanding. They had searched the scriptures diligently that they might know the word of God. Now this is not all. They had been diligent in prayer and fasting and they had the spirit of prophecy and so on. That's not all. They had been missionaries for 14 years. We think of diligent missionaries full of zeal and enthusiasm for two years. Uh, Elder Brewerton over there, he served two and a half years as a young missionary because that was what it was in those days and many, perhaps many of you likewise. But that's not all. They suffered many afflictions, diligent through the midst of these afflictions. They suffered much in body and in mind, hunger, thirst, fatigue, mosquitoes, bedbugs, all kind of beaches, uh, whatever. You, you just know that they had to suffer a tremendous amount of, of, of problems and so on. But they went on and they served heroically and diligently. Uh, let's, uh, let's find some more on diligence. Uh, here's one in Jacob. Uh, Jacob chapter 6 verse 3. How blessed are they who have labored diligently in his vineyard. Oh, this is the Zenos allegory. And you remember all of the digging and dunging and pruning and, and grafting and all of the digging up and transplanting and the burning. And they were really diligent as they worked through uh, all of this process in the Zenos allegory. Uh, next one. Uh, well, this is Jacob again, chapter 4, verse 3. Now in this thing we do rejoice, for we, or and we labor diligently to engraven these words upon the plates. Uh, we write with a ballpoint pen or a pencil or even pen and ink. Think how easy it is. Think how hard it must have been to, to write those plates. Thin metal, if you push too hard, you puncture it. I've tried to work in thin copper, as some of you have, and you push too hard, you hammer too hard, it splits, you break it. Imagine writing just with enough pressure to, to make the beautiful letters and the figures and, and uh, things, but, but not too hard because it'll go right on through. Uh, they work dil diligently, even writing. Um, here's my last one on diligence, Jacob 1. Uh, verse 9, no, Jacob, yeah, Jacob 1, verse 19. We did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility of answering the sins of the people. If we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence. Diligence just has to mean hard work, but it also means dedication, determination, uh, dependability, persistence, all kinds of good words. Uh, we perhaps don't use diligence as much today as they used to, but it's, it's a great word. Now, uh, heed. Heed means, how are we doing on time? Okay. Heed means hear, hearken, obey, pay attention to. We don't use heed very much, but let's go through a few, uh, few examples of heed here in the, in the Book of Mormon. First Nephi, Chapter uh, 16, verse 3. Oh, wait a minute, I've got one before. Uh, 1 Nephi 15, 25. I, Nephi, did exhort them to give heed unto the word of the Lord. Uh, that's obviously obey, twice in verse 25. It's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, in fact, I've got noted in my scriptures here, James 2 uh, verse 10, it says, if you obey the whole law, except for one point, you're guilty of not obeying any of the law. Now, I imagine that's, that's, there's a little bit of room for interpretation there, but it's like a chain. The strength of a chain is not the sum of the links, it's the weakest link. Likewise, that's what he's saying here. Um, he wants them to give heed to the word of God and remember to keep his commandments always in all things. 
And so to me, heed is not just one or two or not having lots of faith in, in some things and, and a little bit of something else uh, because your spiritual strength is really the, your weakest, weakest link. Now let's go on to some other. This uh, First Nephi chapter 16, verse 3. Um, Behold, my brethren, if ye were righteous and willing to hearken to the truth and give heed unto the truth. Uh, let's go on to Mosiah. Mosiah, I've lost it. Mosiah, verse 26. Nope, that's not it. Anyway, that's another one that I'll close with. I thought I had heat on this page, but I don't have heat on this page. So let's go to Mosiah chapter 5, verse 11. That's a good one. Nope, that doesn't say Mosiah 5, verse 11. Something happened to my system. There it is, yeah. Mosiah 5, verse 11. And I would that ye should remember also that this is the name that I said I should give unto you, that never should be blotted out, except it be through transgression. Therefore, take heed. This time it means be careful. Be careful that ye do not transgress, that the name be not blotted out of your hearts. Uh, be careful. There's some double meaning there. Uh, we go on to Alma 37. Verse 44, twice in this verse, he uses the word heed. For behold, it is as easy to give heed to the word of Christ, in other words, to follow, to obey, which will point you to you a straight course to eternal bliss, as it was for our fathers to give heed to this compass, the Leahona, which would point unto them a straight course to the promised land. Uh, let's go on to another heed. Here's heed uh, in Alma 45, verse 23 and verse 24. You can read those. Then let's go on to Moroni. Moroni chapter 7, verse 14. Wherefore, take heed. Again, it's be careful, my brethren, uh, that ye do not judge that which is evil to be of God. So heed is something that is used frequently, uh, used quite a bit. And uh, I recommend it. Now, I've got time for some more stories. A new writing appears from time to time on the Liahona. Now, I asked a Mexican artist once if, if, if he, and showed him the scripture, and I said, if you had a ball with two pointers in it and some new writing that has to appear on it from time to time, where are you going to put the writing? Inside where they can't read it or outside? And he said, oh no, it's got to be outside. Well, would it be a band around it or, or how would you put it? And uh, he said, I'll think about it. And so the next time I came by, he had a sketch of a round ball that was on a stand and I've got it at home. He made it for me, but I forgot to bring it. Uh, just as well, I haven't polished it for years. But uh, inside he put two, two pointers, he put some circles around it, but then on some brackets outside, like the rings around Saturn, he had a flat horizontal circle about an inch wide all the way around. And he says that's where the new writing would occur. Now that's, that's a, a return missionary and his father that were copper artisans in Mexico, and that's what they came up with once upon a time for me, but it's their own imagination. We don't really know how the new writing would be. However, I would be willing to guarantee each one of you have had a new writing experience, your new reading, new writing experience as you read the Book of Mormon. Any of us going through the scriptures, and the Book of Mormon in particular, you've read it a hundred times, a thousand times, and yet one more time and something jumps out at you. Let me share with you three of my favorite new writing experiences. Number one, Mosiah chapter four, verse 26. Look at this one. If you want to, if you want to take the time to look in your, your own Book of Mormon, it's Mosiah four, verse 26. And now for the sake of these things which I have spoken unto you, that is for the sake of retaining a remission of your sins. I must have read that 
you know, over the years, many, many times, and, and I always went right through it, not paying any attention to it. In my mind, it was saying to obtain a remission of sin. No, it's to retain. We obtain a remission of sins through faith, repentance, baptism, but to retain, we have to renew our covenants with the sacrament weekly. We have to progress up through the temple ordinances, renew those regularly. And here's a new indication of how to retain a remission of your sins. I would that ye should impart of your substance to the poor, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. In other words, generosity is an ingredient necessary to retain the remission of your sins. You can't just be baptized and then, then uh, let the oars go uh, no longer working. Interesting. Here's a phrase from the Islamic religion that I think is choice. They say prayer gets you halfway to heaven. Fasting gets you to the very gates of heaven. And generous alms get you inside the gates of heaven. So generosity, when you have the opportunity before you, uh, remember that particular scripture. Here's another one that happened to me. Moroni chapter 7. I was preaching to a group of missionaries about the need for missionaries to be angels. That People, that means you've just got to be perfect, everything you do. You just can't make any mistakes because the people see you as angels, and I hope and pray each one of you missionaries have that privilege. Somebody, some one of your investigators will tell you that they actually see you as an angel because of the message that you're bringing. And I was reading this scripture to them, Behold, have miracles ceased? Behold, I say unto you, Nay, neither have angels ceased to minister unto the children of men. And a new thing jumped out at me at the top of the column on, alongside. If you've got your Book of Mormon, chapters, Moroni chapter 7, verse 29 says, Nay, neither have angels ceased to minister unto the children of men. And all of a sudden, verse 31 started to flash like a neon light. And so I said, Oh, let me read this to you without knowing what was happening. And the office of their ministry, the office of ministering angels, is to call men unto repentance, and to fulfill and do the work of the covenants of the Father, and to declare the word of Christ unto the chosen vessels of the Lord. And it hit me, no wonder investigators see missionaries as angels, because ministering angels do exactly the same thing as Missionaries. Missionaries declare, the, the office of a, of a missionary is to declare uh, repentance, to do the work of the covenants, to lead people into the waters of baptism, and to declare the word of Christ under the chosen vessels of the Lord. All investigators are the elect. They are chosen. They are special. They have a destiny if you missionaries do your work right. So I said, you missionaries are doing your part, angels are doing their part, people receive a testimony, they see you, but they feel the influence of angels. Wow, no wonder they say you are angels. It's not just because you're so handsome or so beautiful, it's because angels are there with you. And uh, hey, I've used that ever since. Missionaries, you are angels and you have angels with you, ministering angels with you. Another my last on this, and I'm almost, I'll quit on time. This one is in Moroni 10, verse 31. You remember there was a moment in the church when great emphasis was placed on the, the threefold mission of the church. Proclaim the gospel, perfect the saints, redeem the dead. Now, Afterwards, other people have found this same scripture and said, this is what it's all about. I found it for myself. I don't think I was the first one, but I don't think anyone else had, had told me about it when I spotted it. It just jumped out at me. Wow, here's a scripture that says, proclaim, perfect, redeem. Moroni 10, 31. 
Awake, arrive from, arise from the dust, O Jerusalem. Put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion. Strengthen thy stakes. Enlarge thy borders. If you do it backwards, enlarge thy borders is do missionary work. Proclaim the gospel. Strengthen thy stakes is perfect the saints. And put on thy beautiful garments means do your family history, your genealogy. Go to the temple frequently. Uh, Anytime there's a reference to beautiful garments, someplace there is a hidden meaning referring to the temple, temple ordinances, temple work, etc. Now, let me close with some additional thoughts. The power of the language of the Book of Mormon. I could, I could tell you some, some fun stories. Let me, let me start with one. In Cuernavaca, Mexico, two missionaries walking along the street, a lady called them over and said, maybe you could help my son. And the missionary is always willing to do, well, what, what is it? And well, follow me. She took them inside, and her son, a university student, was in his room studying. And she said, son, maybe these young men can help you with that page you found. And he said, oh, and he shuffled around through the papers and pulled out a single page that had Two columns on both sides, no pictures, nothing. And he said, I found this in the street. I've read it. I'm fascinated. Where is this from? And of course, the senior companion said, well, it's from the Book of Mormon. I happen to have one right here. It's page such and such, put it in it, and said, if you will read this book from cover to cover, you will know that it's true, and I'll give it to you for free. And the fellow took it and said, well, I'll, I'll read it. I'm fascinated. He and his mother joined the church. There's converting power even in the language of one isolated page from the Book of Mormon. Another story. I was in Cali, Colombia. And the stake president called on a man to bury his testimony in a meeting. And it was fascinating. It was about the Book of Mormon. He said, I'm poor. I work in the sugar mill outside of town. I ride a company bus to and from work. It's almost an hour's ride. And he said, I love to read, but I can't afford to buy a new book. And so I went to the bookstore that I know has some old books, and I said to the owner, where's the cheapest book you've got that's at least 500 pages long? And the owner said, there's a box over there, and the price is marked on them. And he said, I found a book of Mormon, no cover, some pages torn a little bit, tattered, splotched, dirtied. But he said, I checked and it, every page was there. It was intact. And it cost me less than one U.S. penny. And he said, I started reading that going to and from work. He said, I got to Second Nephi chapter 2. Isn't it fascinating? That's the chapter that Hugh Nibley says is the most intellectual, the most spiritual, the most powerful of all of the chapters of the Book of Mormon. Think of the language in chapter 2 of 2 Nephi. It is electrifying. It is fabulous. And this fellow said, I got there, and I, he said, I just had, had the impulse, ask God what this is all about. And so he said, I closed my eyes and talked to God and asked what this book meant and what was I supposed to do and, and where could I find the, the church that, uh, that it represented. And uh, that night, two missionaries on their way home, tired but feeling the impulse to stop and ring one more doorbell, they saw that house, rang the doorbell, and uh, it was one of those doors that was right against the street. And as they op the fellow opened the door, the light from inside fell on a Book of Mormon that one of the missionaries had in his arm, and the title was showing. And the fellow said, you've got my Book of Mormon. And the missionary said, no, it's mine. <laughs> he said, no, no, I have, I have that book. I've been, I've been wanting to find out where it came from and what it's all about and so on. And so the missionaries came in. He joined the church together with his family in about three weeks. Typical kind of situation. 
the Book of Mormon, even one that costs less than one penny, or those that are for free. Uh, fabulous. One, one last story. This one's from the States. These, don't, these things don't happen just in South America. I went to a state conference in Georgia, down on the Florida-Georgia border. I can't remember what stake it was, but there was too much time left over. The, sp the speakers that the stake president had ran short, which is almost unbelievable. They always run long. But we had about five minutes to 11, and, uh, and the last speaker just finished, and he said, do you want to have the stand-up hymn, or would you like another speaker? And I said, well, you've had all men. Uh, do you have a sister available? And he said, well, there's a Relief Society president over there, and there's a new bishop's mother on the end of the fifth row. Never have I called on a new bishop's mother. All, all stake presidents have, have, they know where the stake president or stake pre Relief Society president is, stake primary president, etc. They keep track of where their key, key people are for some reason. And he said, there's a new bishop's mother. And that's all he said. I said, call on the new bishop's mother. It just seemed like the thing to do. She came up scared to death, trembling, and I whispered to her, just tell us how you joined the church, or, or tell us something about your testimony. I didn't even know she was a new convert. She said, my son and his wife joined the church a few years ago. And since that time, they've made my life impossible. They have flooded me with tracts, and with pamphlets, and with magazines, and with booklets, and with the Book of Mormon every six months. And she said, I have probably a dozen unread copies of the Book of Mormon in my closet. And she said, then they did something different. I had a birthday a few months ago, and this time here was a gift-wrapped package, beautiful. She said, I opened it, and here was the most beautiful leather-bound book I've ever seen. The hard cover, leather-bound, large print, embossed. It's very much like this one. Uh, she said, it is gold-edged. It's indexed. And she said, it had my name embossed on the cover. She said, I knew that my son and his wife had spent at least a hundred dollars on that book. Just had to be. And she said, I have some beautiful leather-bound books in my library and it would look good with them. It was just the right size. And she said, I decided, all right, I'll put it in my library. And it's such a beautiful book. They've gone to such trouble. The least I can do is look at the first page. And she said, I discovered the first page of the Book of Mormon doesn't have a number on it. And she said, I went backwards looking for the number, and so I decided to read the title page, and then the introduction, and then the other pages that follow. And she said, when I got to that little short page that should have number one on it, but doesn't, she said, I read that short page, turned to page number two, stopped, picked up the telephone, and I phoned my son. And I said, son, thank you for the beautiful birthday gift. And he said, oh, mother, we hope you, you will enjoy it. We hope you'll read it. We know you haven't read any of the other copies of the Book of Mormon that we've given you. And she said, son, I've just read the first page of the Book of Mormon. He said, oh, mother, that's wonderful. That really makes us happy. Please read the rest of it. And she said, son, it's true, isn't it? And he said, yes, mother, I guarantee it's true. Every word of it is true. You'll love it. And she said, I give up. Send the missionaries. I'm ready. <laughs> First page of the Book of Mormon. Now, of course, there's all that work that they've been doing and so on. Brothers and sisters, the language of the Book of Mormon is powerful. It's beautiful. It works like the Leohona, according to the faith, diligence, and heed which we give it. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. The gospel is true. Heavenly Father is in his heaven. He lives. Jesus is not dead under a shroud or in a tomb. He lives. Resurrected, glorified, exalted. He stands physically at the head of this church, which bears his name. The Book of Mormon is part of the cornerstone of our religion. I testify of that with all the love and passion I have in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.